Good afternoon. Hello, Gary. <laughs> Welcome back. Um, my name is Marilyn Dumont. I'll be the moderator uh, for the talking circle. And uh, I've never seen a talking circle with a moderator before, but I'm going to try. And I'm very, um, I'm very humbled to be with this very esteemed uh, panel, talking circle of, uh, of Métis knowledge holders. And so uh, I just am very, very humbled to be here. And um, one of the things that I thought we could start with, because um, especially for people who had not heard any of this information before, <clears throat> the first time I heard it was about 10 years ago. Um, and it, I was just filled with such grief. Uh, I could hardly leave the auditorium without uh, just sobbing. Uh, so uh, what I thought we could do is open up with um, uh, a prayer that I'm going to offer um, our esteemed uh, elders, Elsie Paul to my uh, right, and my sister Doreen Burgum next to her, um, Lloyd Cardinal, and Elmer Winnie Andy, who's helping us get water and the rest of it. So, um, um, but I'm going to let them introduce themselves. Um, I feel totally inadequate to do that for people who have lived many years more than me. And uh, so, uh, but I would first like to ask them if they could offer, each one of us, e each one of them could offer a prayer for us to begin with. Whoever wants to start. Is it on? Yes. I'm Doreen Burgum Dumont. Let's, let's stand up. I'm a Métis elder for Region 3, which is um, Métis Nation of Alberta, from Morningside to the U.S. border. So I get around. <laughs> and which is really an honor and a privilege. I've been the elder for um, seven years now, and they've asked me to continue. And I told Lawrence, I said, I don't want to die on the job. <laughs> so I'm 73. <laughs> but anyway, um, I'd just like to say this prayer because this room is full of the spirits of our ancestors. And we are all feeling it today. So God, our creator, we ask you to watch over us as we celebrate and walk in the footsteps of our ancestors. We ask for forgiveness and reconciliation of all who have offended us. And as we move forward, we ask for strength and spirit and to be strong for those ancestors, for their loss, for their grief, so we can become the proud Métis people that we were intended to be, the Tuananon. Okay. I'm Elsie Paul. I'm a Cree Métis from what I've learned from my history, and uh, I acknowledge both of my cultures. So and I, I'm going to say my prayer in my language because I'm very grateful that I have my language still even though I'm intergenerational, you know. So I wish I could um, say it in Machif language better because I know a few words in that. And that lady that's teaching it, I want to see her later because I want to take that, that language. Okay, so I'm going to say it in my language. <laughs> 
mina bmat soon uchte, he wa mino mantaski na nuchki naskum nan, wahku tu in uchte. Jo asum sunan at me no sim nan at me niganik no aku magan nan a gawi taksun tiga one mochse magin naskum nan. He wa no kum nan a quesi ki pegan kshna maguiaki kakiogi way, mina nimusum nan a quesi ki nagatim guiaki. Kakiogi way uchkin naskum nan. Eu guan ma bewi te o nana nuht, kwees ngoi maam te nei te naan, kwees ngoi tapah te naan, e guan mina kwees ngoi piks kwa naan. Ka ki eogi guai otkin naskom te naan o tau i naan e ukse. Merci. Hello. I'm Elmer Wani Andy. I'm from Fort McMurray, I was born there in 1949, and uh, I'm uh, 1935 was my local uh, Métis, and uh, in 19 uh, in uh, in 13 1913, they uh, no 2013 they made me an elder, <laughs> and uh, so ever since then I've been going around few schools and talking to the younger ones and, you know, having fun with them because they're so beautiful. <laughs> I mean, they are, all of them. And then sometimes I do a little speaking at the church or, but yeah, it's, it's been fun. I love it. And tonight, this afternoon, I'd like to uh, say a prayer for everyone across the world, not just for us, but everyone here. We have so many people here with different stories. We gotta learn how to share these stories. It's so hard for us to let loose, but we have to. Because our, our younger people that are coming up, they gotta know these stories. And they gotta be able to pass them on to their younger ones. So yeah, stories are very important. So with that, I'll say a, a prayer. O oh, great spirit of our ancestors, I raise my pipe to you and to the messengers, the four winds, and to Mother Earth, who provides for all your children. Grant us your wisdom so we may teach our children to love, to respect, and to be kind to each other always so that they may grow with respect in mind. And help us to learn to share all the good things that you provide for us on this earth. Hi, hi. Hello, everyone. My name is uh, Lloyd Cardinal, and I, I come from uh, Wolf Lake, Alberta. And uh, I just want to say that there's, there's not very many of us left and uh, Wolf Lake isn't something that uh, is mentioned a lot unless you talk about it or you know about it. Um, I had a lot of like uh, family members that have died on the streets here in Edmonton. And um, right now I have my father, he's in a seniors lodge and he was born in a cabin north of Wolf Lake and he was delivered by my, my chichima my, my great-grandmother, she delivered everybody. <laughs> but uh, my, my dad has dementia, and he sits in a senior's lodge in the city, and he hurts in his heart about Wolf Lake, because that's where he comes from, you know? And uh, that's who I'm thinking about today, because yesterday was his birthday, you know, and he's 71 now. So I'll say my prayer. Uh, Friend, do it in this way, that whatever you do in life, do the very best that you can with both your heart and mind. And when you do it in this way, the power of the universe will come to your assistance if your heart and your mind are in unity. When one sits at the hoop of the people, one must be responsible because all of creation is related. And the hurt of one is the hurt of all. And the honor of one is the honor of all. 
and whatever we do affects everything in the universe. If you do it in this way, that is, if you truly join your heart and mind as one, whatever you ask for, that's the way it's going to be. With that, I'll, I'll say in my language, Naskumtanao, no tawinan, naskamao, semantu. Hi, hi. Hi, hi. Thank you all very much. Um, I think what we'll do is um, some people, as part of their prayer, introduced where they're from, but I think um, I might get people to talk a little bit more in depth about where they're from and um, the community that I guess that you identify with and uh, maybe something more about yourselves. So maybe I'll start with Elsie. Okay, I learned back in the day that I was born on uh, Wolf Lake Métis Settlement. But then my mom and dad um, had to relocate to Sad Lake, to my mom's land, you know, in Sad Lake, because the government took over the land. My dad told me they had to relocate. We didn't have no place to go to, he said. And I guess my grandpa there had a little McDonald farm. And so we went to Sad Lake when I was two years old. I don't remember, but they told me that. And so I grew up in Sad Lake, and, um, and so um, I never even went to school till I was 11. Mom and Dad didn't send me to school. I did not understand that, you know, because I didn't learn anything about my Métis culture or Indigenous culture. I was, didn't know anything of that. Nobody taught me. It's understandably so, because after I learned the history of our people, uh, both my mom and Dad were in residential school. Why would they send me to school? They must have had a really negative experience about that, you know? And so I didn't go to school till I was 11. I didn't understand a word of English when I went to school. And then when I went there, I got even strapped for speaking my language, you know? And it was a, a school on the reserve. You'd think that it would be different. You know, the policies might have changed uh, that we were allowed to speak our language, but we still weren't allowed. But to make the story short, you know, I, um, I um, learned about discrimination there in the school because every time we needed supplies, there was a big commotion that happened and we were being called apitogosan, you know, beggars and stuff like that. I didn't understand those words, you know. I thought I was the same because I lived on the reserve and ate the same food. I was the same color, you know, and yet here, we weren't, you know, I had this sense of not belonging in a school. We were different, but I didn't understand what that meant, you know. And so, therefore, I was 11 then, and, you know, my goodness, I felt very out of place in school because of what the kids would say to us. But later on in life, I wrote a skit about it, you know, about um, pencil scribblers and books, and it was based on discrimination because that's where I learned. And I'm not saying anything bad about Sad Lake, but still, it was the children that really made me feel discriminated, you know, in school. And anyway, I left Sad Lake. I couldn't wait to leave there, because even our relatives would be teasing us. They'd say, you know, those are derogatory names to be called to, you know, and I did not like it, so I couldn't hardly, I just wanted to leave. I ran away, you know, when I was 16, you just turned 16. They found me on the highway, my mom and dad, and then um, my dad was screaming reform school, and then my mom was very, always patient, you know. She said, I'll get your uncle and auntie to come and get you. And she did get my uncle to come and get me. His name is Stan Daniels. That's my uncle through marriage, you know. And so therefore, I came to the city two weeks after I turned 16. Oh, my goodness, I went through a cultural shock like you wouldn't believe, because we totally lived on the land in Sad Lake at the time. There was no electricity, no running water, no nothing. I didn't even know what a TV was. If you know, want to know that story, it's in a book. It's called Off Reserve. And it was my uncle that, um, you know, taught me a little bit what Métisism was about. Because he was trying to, I guess he was preparing me to the push-button world of the white man for two weeks. He was showing me. And I'll briefly mention, because this is the journey we all 
go through many times. You know, we go to somewhere strange, it's, we don't understand it, you know. And he was explaining this, he pulled this monstrosity of a thing out of the, the, the closet. And he was explaining, and then he plugged it in. I don't know what that was all about. And he turned it on, and it made that, ah, I went like that. I got scared. It was a vacuum cleaner. I didn't know. <laughs> this, this is how bushed I was when I came to the city, you know? I didn't know anything like that, you know? And I certainly did not know anything about my culture. And so, therefore, uh, the thing, the other thing, he said, say hello, say hello. And he's putting this, you know, that was hooked up off the wall. And finally, I said, hello. And I heard my cousin's voice. Again, I screamed, you know, I, <laughs> I got scared, you know, because it was a phone. I didn't know what a phone was. So I always say, I'm like the hillbillies. You know, when they went to California, I can relate with them, you know. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I'm a hillbilly. So, but anyway, it took a long time because of the fact I was so lost. I didn't know who I was, what I was. I didn't fit on the reserve. Then I came here and then I was being called squaw now by the non-Aboriginal people. And I thought, what is that? What's going on here, you know? Then again, I felt disconnected. I didn't belong, you know? And of course, when you don't have that sense of belonging, you turn to, you're always searching, searching, searching to, feel somewhere that you belong or something to make you feel good. And I discovered alcohol and drugs. And that's what I hooked into first time I drank. Oh my gosh, you know, it made me feel so good. It hooked me. And then the drugs and the alcohol. To make the story short, I ended up having children. I brought my sickness to my, um, my marriage and I, my life was chaotic. You know, I raised my kids in chaos with drugs and alcohol, and I was also a psycho mom, you know? And so therefore, I wasn't able to, to teach my children anything positive, even about the culture, and I got into big trouble. Child welfare and everything, you know? But back in the day, they taught me, if you don't straighten out, you're gonna lose your kids forever. And I did, because I, I loved my children so much. But I didn't know enough about the culture, Métis culture, indigenous culture, but in my healing, I slowly started learning that. And thank heavens that I did learn about Métis culture and indigenous culture, and that's how, you know, I live today. As you can see here, we can do a whole workshop just from these things, you know, of our culture. And my ring is Métis, you have a ring that I, I, and this one elder said to me, well, you either got to be native or, or Métis. She, and I thought, well, we both have rich culture. And I'm the, one of the luckiest people. I have the best of the both worlds. And then I did my genealogy too, you know, and found out that um, my ancestors were, my ancestral grandfathers were born in Quebec. And you can find one of my ancestral grandfathers on the internet, his name is Paulette Paul you know, and Henry Paquette is the other grandfather, you know, that's on my dad's side, you know. So uh, this is a very long story. If you want to read it, it's in that book. It's called Off Reserve, you know. So <laughs> I'm one of the people there that they, you know, so, but I'm really long-winded and I'm always afraid because of time, because I do workshops and one of those I do is Kayaso Pignawaso, which is all child rearing practices. I talk for six hours for four hours straight, and I'm not saying that to brag. What I'm saying is, when you connect to your culture, you get gifts, and one of them is talking, but now I have to balance that, you know? <laughs> I have to harmonize it because I end up, people are always, I told her if you, if I talk too much to school like this, I'll quit, <laughs> you know, so, 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 but you know, those are the gifts we get when we become culturalized in our culture. We begin gifted with strength, knowledge and wisdom, and, and courage, you know. So I can't say enough about the culture. It is so beautiful. Both of our cultures are beautiful, you know. And there's a, a lot more I want to talk about, but I have a feeling she's going to go like this to me in a minute, you know. So, but I just, and I, I have a Métis card and a treaty card on one hand, and I'm landless in my own country. I don't have land base, you know, and so I, we lost, historically, there's been land loss in our family, 
you know. And I did get eventually a land in a Kikino Metis settlement. And I just about lost it a month after I got it, but I went over the council's head and I was able to get 160 acres of my land because that's how much I bought. Yes. And I wasn't going to settle for any lesser anymore. I did a lot of screaming and swearing, but I managed to get that land, you know, and I wasn't sure I was going to get it, but this is the way I am. I'm kind of a radical. People tell me I'm radical sometimes, you know, but when I have my rights, I do stand up for them. But I couldn't do that until I gained my culture because I become stronger as a woman, you know? And so therefore, when that guy came the next day, because I had gotten my t the tent from my dad and I went and pitched it up in front of that trailer because it's my land, but they didn't give me the key because they couldn't, you know, because they didn't have that agreement with uh, um, the housing that was uh, took care of the, the trailer there. I pitched my tent up in front of my that, that trailer when I first bought this land, and then that guy they gave the half the land to came the next day, and I just stood there like this. I, you're on my land, I said, you know. He didn't say anything. He just looked around, you know, and he finally, hmm, he said, and he drove away. Then I came to the city. There's longer story about that. Read it in the book. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, so, but I did win my, you know, my whole... 160 acres of land, I did get it. You know, I ended up in Brownlee building, and they gave me a Wilfax, the, the, you know, there's no arrears on the land. But this is one funny thing. We go through such journeys in our life, difficult ones, but if we just go ahead, and we'll, we'll succeed. And I want to encourage, we have, women are, have power. You know, we have power as women. We just need to reclaim those roles that we lost through culture, through assimilation, uh, colonization, and residential school. I did get the land, but it was so funny when I went into that Brownlee building. He said, I got to check if there's arrears on the land, you know? And he brings this book about this big, and he's sitting there going like this, and he's checking if there's arrears on the land description number. I felt like I was in heaven. St. Peter was trying to figure out whether I made it or not, you know. So, so. <laughs> but then, and then he said, "Oh, I got it. Uh, I got to take another one." And he comes back, and then he finds the land description number. And he said, "No, there's no arrears on this land. It's your land. I'll get my secretary to uh, draft up a letter that will fax it to them. And you get one on Monday. You go tell them the land is yours." And that's how I regained that land that time, you know. And so therefore, I um, again, I lost it in 1993, you know, because now my mother had regained her status as Bill C. Third one, because, you know, they lost their status when they married. Of course, you know that. She married my dad, and he, she lost her status. And they regained it, and she kept on bugging me to be treaty, and you know, it's gonna be good for you when you get old, your medical will be paid. So I finally did, not knowing I was gonna get lose my land. And here I did. You know, had I known that, I would have never, not that there's anything wrong with those, you know, but I don't agree with that, that Indian Act and the treaties and all that. It did damage to our people. We didn't have to be treaty before European contact. We were connected to the land, so. But anyway, I lost my land again. Oh my goodness, that was horrible. So I couldn't gain it. Um, and I tried to give up my treaty status. I can't do that. I can't give it up, you know, not that I don't want to. The government does not want me to. So I'm landless in my own country, but I don't care what the government does. I'm spiritually connected to Mother Earth, and no matter what happens, nobody's gonna take that away from me. And then my ex-husband and my son passed away a year ago last year, and the only member that was in Kikino on the land, the only member was my son, and he's brain injured. And he can't talk. I thought, no, we're not gonna lose that land. I immediately got a hold of Métis land registries and I explained them, and I'm the executor of the trustee of my ex-husband's will. So I provided all the information. I don't want my land to last, I don't want my son to lose that land. 
So they, they asked all the information, I provided the document. And then now he owns those two pieces of land in Métis Settlement, even though he can't talk. And I got the other one to come and live there. And, you know, now he's a member. So I think there's a little bit more protection on the land in Kikino now, you know. But I wish, I wish that I could, um, you know, be, um, I know what it's like to lose your land, you know. <laughs> So, but, you know, they're not Métis land. I feel so good being here. You know, I just, um, okay, I am ready to quit now. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I, I <laughs> Thank you very much, Elsie Paul. And uh, I do take instructions because my sister said we should stand for the prayer. And so I stood up. <laughs> my sister, Doreen Burgum bossy sister. <laughs> well, thank you, Elsie, for the talking stick. It took a while, but you did good. <laughs> Just teasing you. No, that's great, and I really honor your story, and, uh, and you're right. Once you pick up your culture and go with it, your life has changed. You get appreciated, you are gifted, and uh, people want want the information from you. They want to know all about you. And uh, sometimes you have to step back and say, I'm not giving you all my information. And it's, it's, it's quite a journey being an elder and uh, getting into these public schools and universities and um, trying to get the Métis way in there. And uh, keep, keep the Métis in there because this word indigenous and this umbrella that we're under that's like putting us in a bowl and say, you're, you're, you're in amongst the rest of them. But our country doesn't know our story. They don't know our culture. And that's why I keep saying, I will go with First Nations, Métis, and Inuit. I will not use the word indigenous because we need to get out there and be Métis and be proud of who we are. But anyway, that's not where I started from. <laughs> You're not taking instructions very well. No, I know. I got <laughs> I got to shorten this talking stick. <laughs> anyway, um, my parents were Mary and Ambrose Dumont, and um, they got married in 1937 at um, St. Paul de Métis. And they started their marriage off with land given to them from our grandfather in Kikano. And uh, they had uh, four children up there. Four of the ten were born in um, Onion Lake, uh, Goodridge, and Lac La Biche. And as my mother put it, we starved. They starved us off that land. There was no way we could farm, no way we could make a living there. And so then um, they... Um, they rented a, I don't know, a farm truck of some sort, and four families left uh, Kikino, the Tremblays, Quinns, Cantels, and Fred Dumont and Ambrose Dumont. And they came to Sundry, because that's where the jobs were. Logging, ranching, farming, anything they could find to make a living. And uh, our parents did start west of Sundry, in a logging camp. And then they moved um, two shacks into on the Bergen Road onto the road allowance, the land between the ditch and the river. And uh, that's where we were raised. Uh, but being um, strapped with cultural laws, couldn't practice our language, our music, our dance. Um, if my dad um, shot a deer or a moose, they would put blankets up on the window and butcher that animal. But they would share it with all the other Métis families on that road. And they did call that road Moccasin Flats. And, um, but they would work all week. And then when it came the weekend, 
they would literally throw the furniture out, what they had, and make room for that dance floor and bring in the fiddles, the guitars, the spoons, and food. And uh, they would practice their dance. Red River Jig, the Reel of Four, um, Drops of Brandy, all the Métis dances. And that's, that was their biggest stress reliever, is uh, the joy of their music and their dance. I would, in fact, sleep under the table. I remember sleeping under the table at five years old, watching all these fancy steps and feet flying, and uh, they were laughing and being there, practicing their culture and enjoying each other, talking their language, and uh, that's how they would celebrate. And uh, it, was, um, it was there, I, when I go into schools and universities, I tell, tell the kids, we're all born with a gift. And um, apparently my, feet, my, my gift was in my feet. Um, and it was doing the Red River Jig and the dance. And I could not practice that until I was 55 years old. And I joined the Métis uh, Nation of Alberta, Region 3. And uh, I didn't know how good I was until I went and competed in the jigging contest. <laughs> But now you can't stop me. I'm still jigging, and um, I tell the kids, you know, enjoy your gift, share it, and uh, practice it, and um, a whole new life comes out of you practicing your joy and living your joy. But uh, we were the road allowance people, and um, at one point, my dad did buy. I'm. I'm not too sure, but he did pay a dollar for the land that we were on. And I was telling, um, is it Keish, Supernaut? Keisha. 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 I said, you can uh, come and <laughs> dig through our garbage. Our garbage is still there to this day, <laughs> and our well. And I will show you the spot. We've already got dug through it and got a few uh, souvenirs, <laughs> but uh, there's still lard cans there and uh, syrup cans and uh, an old uh, box spring that they used to use. But uh, that was our life, and uh, I just wanted to share with you that Sundry did not have any history of the Métis people. We weren't included in their history books. We weren't included as a people in that town. And with 34 or 35 Métis families in Sundry, before it was a town um, in the 40s, we were there. We helped build that town. So last uh, Saturday, which was, it was a very joyous, joyous day, um, my daughter and I, we already had a, um, a Métis display in the museum. But uh, I'm, the Mate, I'm, the Haver, I'm the secretary for the Métis Havenot Cultural Society out of Big Valley. And uh, we did these storyboards. So my daughter and I donated um, 14 of those storyboards out of the 27, telling the story of the Métis, about the sash, the flag, our recognition. Uh, we picked 14 of those posters and donated them to the Sundry Museum and uh, rededicated that to the Road Allowance people of Sundry. And um, so they can. People can come through there, through the museum, and learn all about us. And uh, it was such a joy giving our history. We had six families um, tell their story about the road allowance and being Métis and Sundry. And this is why I tell, I'd like to tell everybody, be who you are in your community and get out there and share your culture. That's the only way we're going to get through this. And uh, that was part of reconciliation for the Sundry area, for the Métis people. And uh, I'm pretty proud of what we've accomplished. Uh, I believe Alice is here. Alice told her story. And the Arnolds, uh, Ghost Keeper, Supernaut, that connection. Uh, Dumont, Vanessa. Um, Packers were supposed to, the Cutrellis. Um, who am I missing? Poburn, LaRondale, P. 
Pichet, oh, Richard, sorry, uh, Pichet Dumont story. And uh, we had them videoed. And hopefully um, we'll do something with that information uh, to share our Métis culture. So I'm going to pass this, this talking stick on to my friend here. Okay, so I, I didn't write any notes or anything. This is just uh, what was handed to me today. So I don't really need that. I don't know why I got it. So, um, <clears throat> so yeah, my my name is Lloyd Cardinal, and I come from Wolf Lake, Alberta. Um, there, there's so many things that have happened in my life, and uh, even when I talk to my uh, my 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 wife about my life, she says. Holy, that sounds like a movie or something, eh? And it, it's kind of funny because um, ever since we were little, like I, I think we were just born into something. I don't know, like uh, if anybody can relate to that. But uh, when I was four years old, um, I have very early childhood memories, and I have childhood memories of Wolf Lake being at my Muslim's place, which was eight miles from the lake. And uh, we were the last family living out, going to the lake. And uh, I remember we used to go there every Sunday. It's kind of like Soup Sunday. So my, my mom and my dad lived on a Elizabeth Métis settlement. And um, we lived in a trailer where a house had burned down. And um, they put the trailer there. And my parents were both alcoholics. And then they used to take us to my Muslims on Sunday to feed us, right? And my Muslim and my Kukum, they always had bannock and, you know, soup going and they hunted, they trapped, you know, like that. And uh, see, for me, um, <clears throat> Wolf Lake was like uh, where we started to go, but because of my, my mother and my father's lifestyle, um, th what happened, that we ended up in the city and then in the city we were taken from our parents. And I remember the day that it happened, because my older brothers and sisters used to hide us from the social worker that was trying to take us. And one day the social worker just came and walked in and that was it. Like, and I, I remember him because he drove a big blue car. It was a Crown Victoria. And I remember he was East Indian. He was balding. And at the same time, when he walked into the place, I was sitting in front of the TV and we just weren't being hit by our, our older siblings at that moment. And I got taken to this place called uh, the Atonement Home. And the Atonement Home is a place where it's Catholic, it's uh, nuns and priests. There's a boys' floor, a girls' floor. It's up by the Santa Maria Gretti Center. And um, the interesting thing was, was that we got moved in there and it was me and my older brothers and uh, they split us up, like my, my brothers and sisters. The younger ones, they went somewhere else. And uh, there was no like sexual abuse. I don't know if it was because it was the 80s or like, I know like Indian residential schools is a different experience for everybody, but I also know that that wasn't classified as an Indian residential school. It was more of like a, a place where foster kids went. I spent two years of my life there and uh, after that, I, I went into six different foster homes. And you know, um, I, I lived with like very wealthy people, and then I lived with like not so wealthy, you know, and uh, everybody always tried to adopt me. And you know what, I always knew that I didn't belong with those families. I always knew that uh, I wanted to go home and be with my family. So I never let anybody adopt me, even when they, they proposed it, they talked about it. It's kind of interesting, one of my foster parents, he was actually in the military, in the Air Force, and he wanted to put me into the military and he wanted me to go to college and university and all these things, he had these plans. Could you imagine who I would be right now if I actually said okay, you know, it's like I, I think about that stuff. Like, uh, but anyways, uh, after those six different foster homes, my Kukum and my Muslim took us and uh, we went and lived out in Wolf Lake. And uh, see, I had been there a lot when I was 
a child and everything. And my grandfather, his name was Isidore Gabriel Cardinal. And my cookum, her name was Dorothy Spikes. But she wasn't my blood cookum. She was my adoptive cookum. And she was from Piapod, south of Regina. And um, she was a full-blooded Cree woman. And uh, she, she went, my, my original cookum had died in 1980. And so I went and I lived with them. And uh, when, I, when I went and lived with my, my Muslim, like he hunted, he trapped, he lived off the land. He had a trap line north of Wolf Lake. It was six miles by six miles. We were eight miles from the lake. We had no uh, running water. Well, actually we did. You, you ran and you got the water, right? And <laughs> the, the, but the thing is, is that we used to go to the lake and then we'd take an auger and drill into the ice and then we'd fill up like three barrels and then go and put those barrels uh, beside the house in the snow in the wintertime. And then when we got bathed, we used a big kettle and like a wood stove and we always got like everybody else's bath water, like because we were younger, it was like, it was a pretty rough experience. But um, my, my point is, is that uh, my, my grandfather, he was, he did sweats. Um, he knew Indian medicines. He used to make medicines all the time. Um, like another thing with my grandfather, when I, I learned about him that when he was nine years old, he was already hunting and providing for his family. And uh, when we were young, that's what he did with us, is he had us go and like set snares and catch rabbits. And then when I was like, like eight years old, um, I already knew how to skin a rabbit without a knife. And it, it's, it's kind of like, uh, it was the way that we had lived there. And um, um, I learned about Wolf Lake and uh, like people had talked to me so like on May 6th, 1960, the people were kicked off the land and it was that day from what I was told by elders. I sat with elders, eh? And I used to listen to them talk. And when we were around elders, we were kind of trained a certain way as children. So when an elder comes into the room, you get up out of your seat, you go and you get him coffee and you don't talk. You just sit there and you listen, right? Um, I learned that... Uh, from my grandfather and he was uh, from like he went through World War II and he basically um, like <laughs> I, I just think about how he felt that day on May 6, 1960 when the people were kicked off the land that day and they were told to leave. You know uh, from what I was told it was done by the military. And you know, the, the interesting thing is, is that there's the air weapons range up there. And it was really close to my grandfather's trap line. Not only my grandfather had trap lines up there, his brothers, my uncles, there's, there's, there's people there in my family that still have trap lines up there to this day. My uncle lives where my grandfather lived. You can see him on, uh, in the newspapers because he's, 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 they wrote, wrote about him saying that he was the last original pioneer of Wolf Lake because when they were kicked off the land that day, he didn't leave, he bought his land. He bought a court fenced quarter section of land and he stayed. But the interesting thing is, is that everybody else went everywhere else. So for instance, there's an old woman, her name was Panona. She was from Saddle Lake and that's how I'm related to all of Saddle Lake. That was my Muslim's auntie. She went to Saddle Lake and she had a family there. I'm related to Desjardins up in East Prairie because they went there. I heard that people even went to Wolf Lake, or, I mean Onion Lake, and like people just ended up going everywhere <coughs> that day. How am I for time? Okay. So for me, uh, I, I left Wolf Lake because my grandfather died in 2000. And when he died, this is what he said to us. You guys, don't fight. He said, and don't hate each other. He said, when I die, he says, I'm not going to be around to be the referee anymore. And he said, and the family family's going to fall apart. And you know what? He said, uh, you guys don't hate each other. He said, love each other. 
you know, like forgive each other. And you know what? He died and the, the crazy thing is, is that everything he said came to truth. The family did fall apart and it got really hard because my family fought over his land. And you know, um, my father didn't fight over the land. He let all of his brothers do that. And all he took was my, my grandfather's World War II rifle and two shirts, two Western shirts. He gave me one. And you know, he said, I don't want anything to do with that. Um, after my, uh, my, my grandfather had passed, it was around 2001, I was 21 years old. I told myself, I went and parked at my grandfather's yard and I sat there in the vehicle and I told myself, I will never come back here again. That's what I told myself inside. And I, I drove away, I left. I got lost in the city, you know, and I, um, I stayed away from my culture. I stayed away from my identity. I got lost in alcoholism. I drank for about 16 years of my life. And maybe it had something to do with uh, intergenerational trauma. Maybe it had something to do with my, uh, my parents both being alcoholics, right? There's a lot of things that I just don't know sometimes because there's no family structure anymore. So whatever happened to Wolf Lake, it, it stemmed to destroying our family, right? Um, when I got lost in the city, I had such a respect for our culture because my Muslim was a traditional medicine man and I attended sweats with him when I was a child. I was hunted with him. We, we went all these different places. I always say they, they don't make Indians like my Muslim anymore. I always say that because he was a real man of the bush. And even the other people in the community respected him and knew him that way. If it was anything to do with hunting, land, fishing, trapping, even the, the fish and wildlife would come and talk to him. And if they, if they found poached game, they would bring it to him because they knew he would use it. So for me, staying away from the culture was because I respected it. But actually, I, I wasn't respecting it because I wasn't respecting myself. Um, there's a, it's like a long story, but my, my life had changed. And uh, I thank the Creator for that. And the Creator worked through my grandmother. I ran into her in the city too, because she was displaced. It was on 113th and Jasper. And that was my Muslim's wife. My, my grandfather had already died. And uh, she helped me. She helped me when nobody could. And how she did it was by telling me the truth. She talked to me about my alcoholism. She told me one day I was sitting, I was having a beer. I felt entitled. I worked for it. She said to me, uh, how old are you now, my boy? <laughs> and I said, I'm, I'm 29. She said, uh, she goes, you know what? She goes, life's short. She said, life's short. And um, you're at the, the age now, like she said, what kind of husband are you going to be to a woman if she wants to be your wife? What kind of father are you going to be to your child? if you're just drunk every day. She said, you know what, life's short. If you don't change your ways now, you're gonna end up running out of time and you'll end up staying like that forever. When she said that to me, I said to her, who the hell are you? And nobody talks to me like that. And all of a sudden, guess what? No words were coming out of my mouth. I was just, she took my words right out of my mouth. After that, my life began to change. And it happened through everyone around me and through, through uh, relationships I developed. But my point is, is that I started to talk about Wolf Lake. And the, when I first started talking about Wolf Lake, it came alive. It was like it was sleeping or something. And you know what's interesting? Is that in a city, people came and talked to me about my Muslim. People came and talked to me, and then I, just give me a moment. Somebody came and gave me 
his eagle feathers and his, his medicines. In the city, all these Indians, they always try to treat you like you're not Indian. And you got to get Indian from them. I know who I am. I don't need anybody to tell me. I'm just going to finish now, like in... Um, so it, it happened recently, recently I, I went out to Wolf Lake, I took the journey there, and it was last summer, and when I, when I went out there, um, I went to my grandfather's land, and when I went there, I, uh, I went out to the lake, I drove out to the lake, and I put uh, tobacco into the lake, and I always go to the lake and I put my hand in the water like this, and I feel the spirit of the lake, eh? And I, I told my Muslim and my Kukum, I said, I'm here. And I was standing with my kids, you know, and uh, I went back to my, my, my uh, uncles and I, I was inside of my, uh, my Muslim's room and I was talking with my Muslim and, uh, or my, my, my uncle and uh, he ended up uh, putting on a tape of my grandfather speaking in Cree and the traditional songs that he sang. My Muslim was an amazing singer. When you hear songs nowadays, they don't sound like that. There's something, uh, something about it. I don't, I don't even know how to describe it. It, it gives you shivers when he sings. And uh, you know, uh, I had this epiphany all of a sudden, right? When I was out on that uh, dock. What the hell am I doing in Edmonton? Like, what the hell am I doing in Edmonton? And how come I'm not here in this beautiful place? You know, and, and then I thought about it. Did my ancestors know? Did they know that that was coming? Did they know May 6th, 1960 was coming? Did they know that they were going to be displaced? So, you know, uh, I, I hear all these different talks, and I hear that they're in talks about the land that even oil companies are meeting with certain people within my family and having meetings and talks. You know what, my, my dad, the one that I, I spoke about earlier, I always tell him, you know, one day maybe the Creator will give you Wolf Lake back. And you know, uh, he doesn't want anything to do with it, he's hurting, right? He doesn't even like to talk about it. But my point is, is that, uh, I want to have Wolf Lake recognized because money can't buy that place. If you go and you see that lake, it's a big, powerful, beautiful lake. And our ancestors are there. And the crazy thing is, is that I had all these questions within my spirit that nobody could answer. And I went and seen my, my dad at the seniors lodge and he was laying in his bed and his dentures were out. He had no dentures in. And you know what, he has dementia, everybody thinks he's not, not, he's crazy now, they all think that, but I know he's not. I went and I told him about Wolf Lake, I told him about how I dream about Wolf Lake, that I go to my Muslims in my dreams and my Muslim is there, sometimes he's not. That I, I explained all of these things and you know what, my dad answered all of my questions that nobody else could answer for me. He told me the reason that I always go to Wolf Lake he said in my dreams, he said it's because my, my ancestors are there. And he said, and you're connected to them. I'm just going to end there now, because I could go on forever about Wolf Lake too. And uh, I, I just want everybody to know that Wolf Lake was one of the 12 Métis settlements. On the west side of the lake, there's people buried there. And their graves are sunken in, and there's no crosses. And my Muslim knew everybody that was buried there when he would take us there. There was all kinds of community there. 
There was places where they danced and they fiddled and everything like that, but they were also very big on Indian medicine traditions and ceremonies. And a lot of medicine people come from Wolf Lake. And another thing is too, is that up by the dock, about maybe like a, a mile up on the right, there's pickerel at 14 feet in, right? <laughs> and they're, they're always there. And then and, and you know what? It's like a wolf lake, you know what I mean? If anyone doesn't know how to skin a rabbit without a knife, I will show you after. No, just kidding. <laughs> but here we go. I'm the kind of guy that likes to stand when I talk so I can let it all out. <laughs> but anyways, uh, each one of these people, they, what they said is just what I was going to say. <laughs> now, from the stories going back for my, myself, you seen me when I was five years old. Yeah. You seen me on TV there on the, in that picture. I was five years old at that time. And uh, I watched things go up and down, up and down, because my family were trappers too, and they were up and down the Athabasca River, and that uh, place I was living in was uh, an old, well, my dad built it himself. It was an old house, but there was uh, maybe eight of us, nine of us living in there, and it was a two bedroom. If you wanted the next bedroom, you had to put a sheet across so that Somebody else would sleep on that side. And then the living room was always full. With extra people coming in, they didn't have to worry about it because the doors were never locked. They come in and in the morning, my mom would feed them. Whatever we had, they had. So this was the way Fort McMurray was at that time, in the early 50s. I was, I was five years old there and uh, I recall we used to run down the uh, Moggison Flats, me and my sister. The sister was one year older than me, and she used to be the leader. Get me in trouble. I used to say that she got me in trouble. I got her in more trouble than she could think of. But anyways, yeah, I learned how to fish and everything from my dad, and learned how to skin squirrels and rabbits. Even did a few foxes and that, but yeah. We had to learn early and how to chop wood and make a fire and to keep the wood going so mom could cook every time she had to cook. She had to have the right wood cut, split the right way so it's nice and she didn't have to make a big fire. She could make a small fire, kindlings for the morning. All that came into the dad used to say, get it done, that's your job. And you didn't back down, you got it done. Same with carrying water. Filling up water barrels, same thing. But all that, everybody else has the same story. But the alcohol was another one. I found that alcohol too. I went to school, I was going to school in Fort McMurray. They call it St. John School. Now you guys talk about residential school. Well, here we go again. Fort McMurray was we couldn't speak our language. They went to our parents and said, these kids do not speak their language in schools. So we lost our language. I can't speak Cree. Oh, I knew, knew a few words, a stum and you know, a few words like that, you know. But uh, no, we couldn't. We got straps. Finally, they said, this guy here is set in the hallway. I'd sat in the hallway while these other guys were learning their ABCs. When I was uh, seven years old, I went to the office, put my hand out, pulled it back. My sister hit her leg. <laughs> so she calls her father. The father throws the book on the floor. He said, pick it up. I said, you pick it up. He said, no, you pick it up. So when I bent down to pick it up, he held me. Then he strapped me. I said, I'm telling my dad. He said, you go ahead and tell your dad. So I told my dad, and my dad spoke with him. He never hit me again. But 
The thing was, I became a runner. No, I wouldn't learn. I refused to learn how to spell or write. Still today, I don't know how to read. <laughs> but uh, I started to learn how to spell and that a little bit on my own. But uh, yeah, residential school, that was residential school. Whenever we spoke our language, boom, we got straps. So everybody else got paid for going to residential school. Our school was just as bad. The teachers there used to bother the kids too. So there was no difference. They see us as Indians. I like being called Indian, not native, not this, not that. I'm an Indian. I love being an Indian. I'm proud to be an Indian. I see these little guys at school and these guys are pecking on them. I walked up to him and I said, hey, leave the little guy alone. He said, you want some? He's quite sized and I'm always small, but I said, let's go at her. I said, I'll give you yours and you give me yours. I'll give you mine and you give me yours, I mean. And anyways, he looked at me and he says, you better get out of here before you get hurt. I said, you get out of here and leave him alone. So like that, I always stuck up for the little ones. And I was little. These other guys just said, oh, there comes Elmer. Watch out. So they left the little guys alone after that. Little girl, one time she was on the bus and she wasn't dressed too good. Her hair is all messed up and everything. And they said, Bertha, you stink. You're ugly. I walked up, I was in the back. I walked up to the front of the bus. I got sat down next to her and I said, you want some? The guys took off, they said, watch out, Elm, I was getting on that. But that's what I did. I used to watch the little ones. And I was a little guy myself. But they always remembered me. I said, yep, there comes Elmer. Even after I got uh, out of school, it was 15 years old, I still wouldn't listen to these guys. They made me a, an altar boy. I was 12 years old. They said, let's make him an altar boy. Maybe we can change this guy. I was a good altar boy, but the only thing is, I wasn't taking their, their scrap or whatever you want to call it. So finally I said, that's it. I quit school. I was 14. I went home and I told mom, I said, I'm quitting school. I'm running away. I won't be back. She said, don't do that, my boy. She said, if you quit school, they're going to take away the whatever they gave $10 or something for kids that were going to school that had a little allowance or something. So I had to stay for another, another year. I turned 15, I left. I said, I'll get a job. I went out and I got a job. I cut wood with this old guy that used to have a, a trap line and he was cutting wood. His name was... Uh, uh, Anyways, he was uh, a trapper, and he used to cut wood and sell it in the, in the city. So I went out and I did that for him. He'd give me a load of wood for the week I worked for him. So mom was happy with that. So she said, okay, my boy, I'll talk to dad. And so she talked to him and he said, okay, as long as he's working. So when I turned 19, I said, well, <laughs> the plant started. So I went down there and I started to work for the plant. And they said, oh, you gotta do these things and you gotta be able to uh, do these tests. No, you had to read and write. I said, hold it. I said, I can't read, I can't write. I said, but if you read that out to me, I'll tell you the answer. He said, could you do that? I said, yes, I could. So he read me out the thing and he read, wrote down the answer. I tell him the answer, he wrote it down. He checked him after a while, he gave it to his buddy, and his buddy checked it. And he said, hey, he, this guy's got 97. Those other guys are only getting 80 and 70. What's he doing with 97? He doesn't even know how to write. <laughs> so I said, right on. So I worked like that. I put in 40 years at St. Crude and Suncor, and uh, I retired. I said, 40 years, that's enough. Let the young guys go in there. So other than that, 
these guys said everything I was going to say because <laughs> Fort McMurray was a good place to live, but it grew too fast and everybody had to change. There was lots to do with alcohol, drugs. I had my share. I think I, I came out of, uh, I think I was, uh, they had some, I just joined 1935 that time. And they started having these meetings and stuff. And they said, we're going to Patosh. So there's some praying going on there and people are getting together. And I said, okay, I'll go. So the first year I went, second year I said, okay, I'll go again because it was good. I met quite a few people. And uh, I was there, I was on, watching up there and this little girl, she comes from way up on top and she says, would you dance with me? because they had the kids going down to dance. And uh, she said, I gotta find a partner. My dad won't dance, my mom won't dance. They're sitting up there. So I said, no, I don't, I don't want to. And I couldn't believe I said that. So she's walking back up there and right now I said, boom, it hit me like, said, get up there. So I went running back up after her. I went there and I told her dad, I said, is it okay if I take her down to the dance? And he said, I wish you would because we don't dance, you know. But our legs are no good. So I went down with the little one, left my jacket. And we got down there and started jigging. Well, I jigged it. Oh, she just loved that way. She was just jigging. Pretty soon all these little ones coming around us were all jigging. And I said, well, this has made my day, right? So now I took her back up there and they thanked me and everything. We had a little lunch together. And then after that, we were coming back to, uh, for McMurray. And I told these guys that were driving, I said, I seen this statue, Mother Mary. I said, it's over there. Everybody goes there to pray. And I think it was my nephew, Bill, or somebody says, well, we'll drop you off there. You can go do your thing, and we'll wait for you over there. So I said, OK, well, I got to go there. For some reason or another, that statue was telling me, you get over there. So I went to the statue. I went there and I just looked at Mother Mary. And I said, could you help me? I was on my knees. Just like that, I was on my knees. I don't know what I actually said or what kind of prayer I did there. But just like that. I asked, I said, alcohol and drugs, that's my problem. Boom, just like something just went through my forehead. I got up from there and I went, <laughs> I went back over there. I don't know how long I was there, but I went back and got back in the car and away we went. Somebody asked me, he said, well, what, what did you say? I said, I said a prayer for everybody. I said, not just for one person in the world, for everybody. And I said, that's the way it's gonna be from now on. They said, what's wrong? I said, nothing, nothing's wrong. So we got back to McMurray. I got home, I went to the fridge, opened the fridge, I had a case of beer and a bottle of whiskey, and a carton of cigarettes. They'd come out of the fridge, put them in a the bag. I had a brother that lived two blocks away, walked over to his place, I dropped him on his table. He looked at me and he said, what's wrong with you? I said, it's yours. I said, no more smoking, no more alcohol. Church starts at 10 o'clock on Sunday. He said, what? <laughs> <laughs> so anyways, that was it. I went to church. I did not miss church since. And, <laughs> and these guys were watching me. 1935 because I had joined in 1935. They were watching me. A few months later, I have a friend, Harvey Sexes. Elmer, when are you gonna come over? What's happening? I said, well, I can come over and visit. I went over and visit, but I didn't drink. Bill says, hey, what's going on? I said, no more alcohol, no more drugs. I said, that's it, I don't even smoke. I said, what do you mean? Don't you have a craving? I said, no such thing. Mother Mary looked after that. So from this day on, I go and get up in the morning. My wife says, what? 4.30. I'm up. 
I'm saying a prayer for the whole world. <laughs> oh boy. This was going on since, since uh, 2013, when I got uh, the Métis uh, honorarium to be, uh, to be an elder. Like they gave me a little sash in a frame. So all I can say is to anyone, all you have to do is ask. And just like that, it could happen to you. It depends if it comes from the heart or not. And you can pass it on to other people. Very easy. You just give them a smile sometimes, and they're so down, they're feeling so bad, boom, what happened? Next thing they're giving a smile to somebody else. And this is, this is a true story. For myself, I just love everybody. And I'm glad that you let me come in here and speak up here with the rest of them. And may God bless you all and keep you all safe. Hi, hi. I think we have time for maybe a little bit more um, responses from, from people around the idea of land and what would you like to see if, in terms of a Métis homeland um, here in Alberta? What are your hopes for the future? Dreams about <clears throat> where we might be or what we could have in terms of Métis land, Métis homeland here. I think we should all reclaim what we lost, you know, like the Wolf Lake Métis settlement because we always, always had to fight for our inherent right to the land, you know. It is our right to be on this land. And so we, land, la we need land base for ourselves and our future generation. So we need to really, you know, take a serious look at reclaiming, you know, like Wolf Lake Métis Settlement. I would give anything to go back to where I was born, you know, and so, um, it's just so unfair what has happened historically to indigenous, to me, and Métis people. We need our right to the land. Because for me, I'm spiritually connected to land, eh, you know. And it's, um, that's how come I didn't want my children, my, my son to lose his land, you know. So anyway, we need to reclaim. That's part of Kokum society is reclaiming our the things we've lost historically, you know? So I feel that way. Okay. So for, for me, like, like uh, I, I, I just wanna stress the, the importance of uh, speaking about places. Like it, I know that this didn't happen to just me. I know that this also happened to even people that are treaty you know that there, there's been land that has been lost or taken and uh, you know I, I, I work in education and I, I speak to youth about these things and what's interesting is when I go into a classroom is like 80% of the youth have no idea who they are and where they're from so like when you ask them uh, in our way Tande Otsikia where are you from they they'll tell you uh, Edmonton right and our They'll say, uh, some say Abbotsfield, right? Stuff like that. But when you look at them, you see, you know, indigenous youth. You see, you see the, our ancestors within these, these children. And um, the funny thing is, is that I ask them their names and then they give me their last names. And because I'm a native and because I was raised with Tande Otsikia, like instead of what's your title or your degrees or your business, it, it's not really our interest. We want to know who you are as Cree people and where do you come from? Like, uh, where does your belly button come from? And if you go into depth, right? But uh, see, the, the interesting thing is, is that uh, by the, when the kids tell me their last names, by their last names, I tell them if they're Métis or Treaty, and I tell them who their families are and where they come from. And you know what? They think that I'm a psychic. <laughs> right? Because they're like, who is this guy? How does he know all this about me? Right? But that's the way that we're raised. 
That's the indigenous way of knowing and being, right? And uh, the, the thing is, is that education, yes, it, it needs to be more focused on identity. Because when you're in the city, it's easy to lose your identity and your culture because you're not in the place that you came from. And a lot of them too, they don't even know what reserve it is or what, what settlement it is that, that, they, that they identify with, right? So for me, I ended up talking about Wolf Lake and then Marilyn invited me to talk to her students about Wolf Lake here at the university. And uh, see, for me, when I started to do those things, it came alive and I even received an email with like a 167 page write up on the history of Wolf Lake that some uh, university student had done. And um, now I'm here talking to you guys, you know, and, and at the same time, I'm, I'm sharing the story with the youth and see like when you talk about it, something happens. If you don't talk about it, nothing will happen. So, you know, having Wolf Lake recognized for the place that it was, because when you go out there, do you know what it says? Wolf Lake Provincial Campground. That's what it says. It's a campground where everybody goes and camps. But also too, there's all these oil field companies out there. There's uh, like, I remember BP, CNRL, Amoco, Esso. There, all these oil companies have been drilling oil out of that area for, for, for generations. And, and one of the interesting things is, is that uh, we used to take a skidoo and like toboggans or quads and we would, or even Argos across the lake. But we would go to my, my Muslim's trap line and it would take us four hours, like with skidoos and toboggans, right? And uh, now you can drive to my Muslim's cabin. And you know, the, the thing is, is that uh, there, there's so much, like, you know, when in, in the Western world, they call it development. <laughs> But us, we, we call it like the destroying of our, our sacred spaces, our lands. And, and, and the, like being out in Wolf Lake, you know, even the, the names of the lakes, they're on the map and they have these names. But when you ask my Muslim, they, all, they have different names. They have, they have names before those names. How, how do you recognize that? How do you speak to somebody and, and tell them the truth? And, you know, we're always looked at as we're, like we're biased when we're indigenous people or we're troublemakers, right? But we're not. I've learned from a friend of mine that we're, we're truth tellers, you know? And, and you have to tell that truth, whether it makes people uncomfortable or not. I go through that every single day. Like I wear like what you call an, a historical jacket and I, I, I can't take it off, you know? And, and when we, we talk about Wolf Lake, how do you have it recognized? How do you honor the fact that that land was taken, that people were from there. You know, my, my grandfather too, he never had a Métis card. He never had a treaty card. And when they came and tried to get him to get a Métis card, you know what he said to them? I don't need your card to prove who I am. You know, that's what he said to them. But that's because he had that connection with the land, right? So many of our children now, they're disconnected from the land. You know, so it, it just, creates a bunch, of, a bunch of questions in my mind. But either way, you have to educate people, even if they don't want to listen to you, even if they don't want to hear you, because eventually somebody's going to hear you. Somebody's going to listen, you know? So thanks. Yes, it's about the land. Oh. We're all connected to land. We all own the land. There's no such thing as somebody else owning land because it's all belonged to everybody from the beginning. The Creator gave us all the space to share. We're supposed to share it. But then it seems like somebody comes along and start taking and pushing. They push the natives so far that they think that they got rid of us. They haven't got rid of us. They haven't got rid of me. I'm still here. I may not own a piece of land. I may not be able to ride horses and go and hunt the way my great ancestors used to do it. But I, I know 
what they done when they started and how that they loved the land. They looked after the land. Now these people come in here and they have their oil fields and everything and if you don't do your jobs on these oil fields the way they want you to, get out, we'll get somebody else. So you gotta listen to them and do their job just like being in residential school. I guess you guys been in there, you gotta do it their way or the highway. But anyways, I worked with guys in uh, Sincrude and Suncourt and that was land that, uh, it hurts because that was, that was the trappers. That was all trappers when I was growing up. They owned all that. We were the people of the land in Fort McMurray. There was no, no big highways out there. It was just one little highway. And you had to squeeze by the next car. And lots of these guys from Lac La Biche and everything used to come up there. And they were just like family because we all knew each other. I recall this one, well, Joe Hamlin's sister, she moved up there with her kids. And before I knew it, I was hanging around with the Coutures because they were, they were friends and beautiful people. I went to school with uh, Jackson and uh, he used to be picked on by some other people and I used to stick up for him because he stuttered and he couldn't really pronounce his words right. But the older boys used to try to pick on him and I said, no, hey, that ain't happening. And they said, boy, that Elmer, he sure thinks he's tough because he's Iroquois. I said, no, it's got nothing to do with being Iroquois. You're supposed to be looking after that little guy. You're bigger than he is. And <laughs> so I used to get that in when they used to see me coming. and said, there comes Elmer getting trouble. So anyways, that, that's the way it is. And this uh, woman I'm talking about, her name was Lena, Lena Couture, and uh, a beautiful woman. When I used to hang with the little ones there, we would go in, she'd put a plate on the table for me too. And I said, whoa. She said, well, your family, get in here. You eat too. <laughs> so that's the way it was in Fort McMurray that time. Everybody knew each other and everybody shared a loaf of bread. If one didn't have it, they'd share half of it with the other one. And that's the way it should have been. But then we got the plants moved in and boom, everybody lost their lands. Their people were losing their houses and stuff like that. It was just sick. And I don't know, we all lost family members leaving Fort McMurray. You didn't ever see them again. You know, and stuff like that, it's just sad. But anyways, yeah, for the land, for the land, for the Métis, I would love to see the Creator just say, hey, boom, you guys got this. You guys got control of this. And the way they're gonna get it, I believe myself, as if the women take over leadership of this world, we'll see a big change that you've never seen in your whole life because the women have the love. They got the love and they can do it. The men just are not doing it. Look at them, they're building walls. <laughs> what kind of deal is that? They're building walls and hurting little children. Now who are they, these people, to hurt a little child? I'm hurt by this, people building walls. They gotta get their story straight because this is not their world. This world belongs to the creator. And if the women don't take over, that's gonna be a shame because the men just can't do it. Hi, hi. Well, moving forward and hearing all the injustice that has been done to the Métis with land and, and uh, the schools, um, I think moving forward, we have to go for the land. Let's go after it. Let's, um, let's try and get back what we lost. I know it's gonna be a slow process, but uh, I think we have to do it. Oh. 
I'm just looking at our time here, and we have a few minutes uh, for questions, if people uh, would like to ask some questions. This is for Lloyd. Welcome home. Uh, it, it is your Auntie Maria, that, your great Auntie Maria, that has become my friend and I her spokesperson. Um, there was a lot of trauma in the past. Um, I just go with the flow. All I can do is uh, look after Maria and give her what she deserved all along. They had. They're, they're, they were like the Wild West. <laughs> That's all I can say about, you know, and you need to, you're, maybe you're the chosen one to uh, write the children's story. Because there's already, I, I know of a fourth generation already that do not know their roots. They do not know where they come from. How you went under my radar, I don't know. <laughs> But, but uh, I knew Isidore, like barely, but he was Maria's uh, brother. Yeah. So welcome home. I thought you were a woman, you should go first. <laughs> <laughs> it's a good one. I just want to say, like, you know, great stories. And I know exactly <clears throat> all the stories of uh, throwing out the furniture and dancing, the strapping, lost of who you were, you know, knocking your identity out of you in school. I went through all that. And then I uh, moved to Fort McMurray. I just want to tell a little stories a little bit, make it fast here. Went to Fort McMurray, worked for, you know, like, I proved to them, they, they said I was lazy. I wanted to prove them wrong, so I, I, uh, I worked for Suncor for 43 and a half years as a welder. And uh, <clears throat> I remember one time, the big boss, I think I was 21 years old, I just started at the time at Suncor, and uh, came over and he says to me, Mr. Cardinal, he says, you gotta be the slowest worker I ever seen in my life. Why is that? I looked at him and I said, sir, it's like this. I'm planning to stay here for 30, 35 years. I said, I'm pacing myself. <laughs> so I was to this day that he had seen me. But the story I'm trying to tell you is uh, back in 1999, I took on fish and wildlife hunting rights. You know, I went to court myself and represent myself to have my hunting rights because that's how I was raised and that's who I was, to have the right to hunt and the land that was given to me. And I wanted to do that. So I had a lawyer that was coming from Edmonton, but like things happen for a reason. The lawyer got sick. And he wrote a letter to the, to the judge to remand the case. And on my way there, my friend and I, Glenn Stasco, I said, Glenn, this just can't be any different than what uh, I do at work to represent people to keep their jobs when they're going to get fired because I was a union steward. I said, so I'm going to take them on. So I ripped the letter up and I went in. And then uh, as the court case went on, they were asking me questions of, uh, you know, how to make Bannock and all these crazy things. So I turned the question around and went, well, why don't you tell me? He said, you know so much of it, right? These were, this is how I was fighting it. And then they'd say, they say, I, I, they, I told them, I'm an Indian. And then they said, treaty Indian. No, I'm not a treaty Indian. I don't have, I don't have my treaty rights. So you're a Métis. I said, I guess if that's what, uh, the, 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 I am a Métis, but 1982 give me my Indian rights to do whatever I have to do, because we belong all in one. If they can hunt, I can hunt, everybody can hunt. So this is, went back and forth. And then, uh, like I say, they asked me all these questions, and at the end, 
the prosecutor had nothing to argue with because I gave him all the answers, all the questions he wanted to know about my tradition, my culture. So at the end, just I'm trying to make this long story short. So uh, he says, he says, Your Honor, he says, Mr. Cardinal here has got a $100,000 job. He's got a $100,000 home. He drives a Suburban. Uh, he's got a, a deep freeze in the house. He's got fridge. He's got, he's describing my home. And he's telling the, the judge the whole thing. And then uh, judge says to me, he says, Mr. Cardinal, you want to counter argue? I said, I got nothing to counter argue because everything he says is true. I do have that $100,000 job. I do have the $100,000 home. And I, he must have visited my house because he described everything I have in my house, but I don't remember him coming in there. But anyway, so he knows a lot about me. So and, and then I said, but I want to make one point, sir. And then he says, go ahead and make your point, Mr. Cardinal. And I said, why do I have to be poor to be an Indian? He said, very good point. He says, you can hunt anywhere at any time you like, sir. That was my case. <laughs> It's me. <laughs> so as a young man, I, I grew up in a Métis community that was beside a native reserve. And uh, my grandparents on my dad's side spoke Cree and Machif and French. And my grandparents on my mother's side spoke Soto, Machif and French. And we had to learn English be, before we went to school. And it, like, my story is no different than anybody else here. Just to make a long story short, when I was 13, in an, in an assembly such as this, a couple hundred kids, the principal called me up and had me, handed me my, my, my exam. And I got 22%. I'm not proud of it, but I got 22%. He handed me my exam, and as I took it, he held it and said, Billy, you will never, ever amount to anything in this life. And I said, oh, OK. So what? I'm used to that. I've been, I've been putting up with that for, 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 for seven years that I've been in school anyways. So I want all those years after that, I always wanted to show him my accomplishments. And every time I went back, he was never there. With the help of my wife, I semi-retired when I was 49. I probably could have retired, but my wife convinced me to go back to work, which I did. So I, I fully retired at 62, which was a year ago. And I just want people to know that the journey that I've been through is no different than anybody else here. So I don't need to explain what I went through what my accomplishments were because everybody that's here today went through the same accomplishments and I, that I did and are, are now being recognized just like I'm being recognized by the people that are here today by letting me have my say. And I, and I can guarantee you, I tell every Métis child that I know that, you know what, if I can do it and 114,000 Métis people can do it, so can you. They are our leaders. Thank you. I'm going home now. So I don't normally talk at these things, but um, Lloyd, uh, I know your mom and dad, and um, my dad uh, trapped your Muslims trap line up until about seven years ago when it was sold to a rich white guy who bought my Uncle Dan's trap line as well. And so I was always at the trap line hunting, and I'm proud to say I shot my first moose, moose at Wolf Lake. Um, and I just want you to know that if you have any questions, you probably, um, by the way, I'm Violet LaPrat from Wolf Lake. So you might know my dad, Joe. Oh, yeah, Joe LaPrat and Dan. Yeah. Dan yeah, so, is another Bushman I, I knew. Yeah, so your Muslim and my dad trapped together until 
uh, your Muslim passed away. So if you have any questions. And, and, and for anyone that wants to know, they don't make Indians like my Muslim anymore, <laughs> yeah. just ask her. <laughs> yeah, for sure. And um, dad's 85, and if he could still be on the trap line, he would. So if you ever have any questions, his number's in the book. Come see I, us. I, I believe that my grandfather, even though he passed away, mm -hmm. he's still there. Oh, he is. He's out at that lake. I stop at his cabin and I sign, yeah. well, the cabin burnt now, but I used to stop by and sign in every time I went by and I'd walk around and talk to him and visit him. So just, you know, Wolf Lake has still got lots of spirit in it. The other thing is when my dad was still out there, my mom and my dad spent one whole summer cleaning the cemetery up because my auntie is buried there, my dad's four-year-old sister. And they found her cross, and my man made a sign, which somebody tried to demolish. So a neighborhood guy who works with metal made a big sign for the Wolf Lake Settlement uh, Cemetery. However, we don't have the means to go across and gather all these people to come and keep that cemetery clean, because the guy was, who bought the line was supposed to take care of that cemetery. Uh, I'd, I'd like to share too that um, my 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 cookum died here in Edmonton, and yes. uh, her niece took her ashes out to Wolf Lake. Oh, did they? But you know what happened? The park rangers stopped her from spreading the ashes in the lake. But you know what was interesting? There was a woman there that worked within the forestry, and she knew my grandfather and my cookum through a relationship. Yeah. So the the park rangers left, and then she said. Just go put them in the lake. <laughs> yes. yes, and I knew Auntie Dorothy yeah, very well. Like, yeah. <laughs> I'm back again a day late, though. I want to uh, speak a little bit about one gentleman there talking about women. Uh, our women are like Mother Earth, they're the givers of life. They neuter their children till they die, 70, 80, 90 years old, whatever. But uh, I just want to remind the membership that we have a woman amongst us here by the name of President Audrey Poitras, mm -hmm. who is the first lady to be elected to a president position within the provinces of the Métis National Council. She's also the longest standing elected person of anybody, men or women, within the Métis National Council, 20 plus years. I'm proud to say she's my leader, and that's Audrey Boitras. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> Thank you very, very much. It takes a lot of courage to come and open your heart like that, and I know that you touch me very much. I relate to all your stories, I, especially that lady there. When we were at residential school, we were unprepared. We came back into a different world than when we were there. The teachings were different, but we, are, we survived, we're here, and we've made a better life for ourselves. But really, one thing, that should have been done because the impact over the years has been tremendous. We were never taught about sex. And so many, many children are running around today still looking for their parents. I uh, also relate to that young man. <coughs> I was a foster mother for 10 years and I uh, heard a lot of stories. And we're working towards getting away from that. Let, let everybody look after their own. Me too, look after our own Inuit, First Nations. And we can do a real good job. I know we can. We've already started. But with due respect to my president, I'm going to tell you something I never told anybody in public. I've only told a few people, I think Doreen, I think I told you. But this is the way they explain sex to us in a convent. Uh-oh. <laughs> okay, I'll never forget from the time you're 14, when some of them go out for holidays or something. Um, the nun used to take us, 14 years and up, 
and bring us in a, in a solarium. And she sat up there on a, where you guys are sitting, on a desk like, and she put her head down and she'd say, you're going to go out in the world and we're not going to be there for, to, to protect you. But you're going to meet boys and they're going to like you. Yeah, she said, uh, they're going to start holding your hand. I'm going fast here because if I did everything that the way I heard it for six years, we'll be here a long time. <laughs> so anyway, she said, and then, and yeah, you're going to like them too. And they get a little bolder. I'm going to repeat that word many times because that's what she said. They're going to get a little bolder. They're going to put their arm around you. And she said, and then the dad's hugging. And then she said, then they're going to get a little bolder again. And then they're going to put their arm around you and touch your apples. <laughs> <laughs> and then she said, if you don't, he said, oh, you're going to like it maybe, but if you don't fight them off, then they're going to get a little bolder again. They're gonna go down, uh, go down a little further. They're gonna touch your peach. Yeah, they're gonna <laughs> give you a banana, banana, and they're gonna have a baby. <laughs> and that, right now today, I don't eat bananas. <laughs> I love you. Okay, take care and thank you. Up there. Oh, I think there was one more question, but we really are running out of time, folks. Um, I'll take the last, last at the mic. We only have one more. Um, sorry, we, we're running out of time. Otherwise, we'll we'll be here till six o'clock. <laughs> Hi, my name is Carol Lambert, and I'm AT. My grandparents are from Fort Vermilion. Um, I just like to say I am so proud, so honored to see elders teaching us young kids. Like everybody's saying they had their story, I got my story. I was young when I was put in the foster home. And then when I learned who I was, I was more prouder than anything in this world. I started going to Métis, Aboriginal days, Métis days, wherever I can. And I met Audrey, which is a beautiful lady. I love her. And then my friend up there from Wolf Lake, I got to meet him at a round dance, the first one I ever went to in my life. And I did the round dance. Now you can't get me off the damn floor because <laughs> I love to round dance. When I am saying I am proud to be a Métis, thank you to the elders for coming forward and telling us their story teaching us what Métis is really about. I was just showing a gentleman. It, does anybody remember the Métis jacket? Jacket they used to wear all the time? And the uh, buckskin shirt? I have a picture of my dad, my Uncle Louis. My Louis, Uncle Louis has got the jacket on, my dad's got the buckskin on. And that's the only picture I ever had seeing them two together wearing the Métis stuff. And that's why I said I'm so proud to be a Métis and learn about my people. Thank you. Thank you very much. OK, OK. Well, thank heavens I could eat bananas a long time ago. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> No, I'm just kidding. This my laughter is, is healing. What I wanted to say was that I'm going to be having a um, professional woman's circle on, on, uh, on February the 18th. You're all invited to come at Terra Parenting Center. It's part of our Kokum Society, you know, and women, we had women's roles a long time ago, you know, in women's societies. So we still need to get together as women because we support each other. It's going to be at 6.30 on the 18th, 99.30, 106th Street. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. Um, I, uh, I, everyone wants to talk now. <laughs> I want to say a prayer.
Okay, but just wait a I second. I just want to say just before uh, just go before go that uh, it's very important. We should never forget. Whenever there's stories shared, we have to give gifts. So I took it upon myself to give a gift to each and every one of them that's uh, sharing the story here. And I know it's not much. It's only nicely put together, put together band CD, but that's what I'm going to do for them. So uh, I want to thank you guys for the stories. And it's important that you shared your stories. And uh, from the bottom of my heart, I enjoyed it. And I want to give you guys each one a CD for sharing your stories. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks, Jimmy Cardinal. And uh, <clears throat> once again, I, w I want to, uh, Dorian's going to say the closing prayer, but I want to thank Elsie Paul, Doreen Burgum, uh, Lloyd Cardinal, Elmer Winnie Andy. I'm very honored to be a moderator. And um, I know Natalie had wanted me to ask all of the presenters today, because she wants a picture, um, to gather and have a picture taken. Where do you want people to gather, Natalie? Just over here? Just to the left of my left. And, Mar and Natalie will also do the closing remarks. But one thing I do want to say before Doreen says her prayer, this is, was an amazing event, and it looked like 100 people did the organizing. But there's only two staff people, and one of them is Natalie Kermol, and the other is Jen Rossiter. And I, I want to thank them for all of their work and their army of volunteers. Uh, so thank you very much, and I'll let Doreen say the prayer, and then Natalie's going to say the closing remarks, and Norma, our elder Norma Spicer, will also say a closing prayer. Oh, they're Norma, trading off. They're doing a tag team. <laughs> Norma, I'd like you to do your prayer. I just want to share this, this poem. When you touch someone's life, it is a privilege. When you touch someone's heart, it is a blessing. When you touch someone's mind, it is an honor. When you touch someone's soul, it is a triumph. When you touch someone's spirit, it is a miracle. Those are the words of Dr. Jeff Mulan, and that's what we did all this weekend, is touch the spirit. So Norma, I'd like you to come and say your prayer. <laughs> Just a short prayer. Heavenly Father, as we come to the close of this conference, we thank you for the guidance, wisdom, and support you bestowed on us. Bless us, Lord, as we leave here today to take your passion with us, fan its flame after we part, and inspire our best contributions. Remind us always of your love and guide our steps and our progress. We ask that the history and current legal matters discussed serve as a catalyst to move us forward and advance our knowledge and determination to seek opportunities to better the lives of Métis people and their communities. O oh, gracious Lord, we leave here recognizing you are the God of all wisdom, and we are aware that nothing is possible without your blessing. We ask that your grace touch our hearts, and that your hand of protection be on us and all our loved ones throughout the year. This we pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. Thank you, Norma. I'd like to say something, too, before we leave. I don't know if this is on. Okay, it's on. Uh, I got something to uh, say to you from... Uh, Chief Yoho, he's he used to be the really guy that used to have something to say all the time, so he said this to his people. He said, humankind has not woven the web of life. We are but one thread within it. Whatever we do to the web, we do to ourselves. All things are bound together. All things connect. That was said in 1854 by Chief Yellowhawk, hi, hi. Okay, so uh, I just wanted to thank everybody uh, for coming uh, during those two days. 
I have to say, when you're in good company, time flies. Really. I didn't see the t time. <laughs> so I'm amazed uh, that we're now and that everybody's going to go home. Um, as Marilyn said earlier, there are no, when you organize something like this, it takes people, because otherwise you can't do it. And uh, so I'd like to thank Jane Rossiter and Shelby Reed, who did a lot of the work, the background work. And also Amy, who's over there in the back, uh, who uh, helped a lot from the Métis Nation of Alberta. And uh, Rolando also, were very uh, key people. And I would like also to, um, to thank Angus and his team for the live stream support. Yeah, because uh, it allowed for a lot of people to be able to follow this event while not being in the room, but being somewhere in their home. So I think uh, in that sense, uh, thank you very much for, for the support. I'd like also to thank all the volunteers, the student volunteers. Um, what I love about the Faculty of Native Studies is our I said that before, but I'll say it again. Our students are amazing. They are, like they never, when we say we need you, they're there. And um, they're very gracious about their time and they want to learn and they can participate in events like this. And I think it uh, does make a huge difference for us and for them also. I'd like to also thank the moderators, uh, Lisa, Aaron, and Marilyn. Thank you very much for accepting uh, to do this. And also the elders, uh, thank you very much for accepting our invitation. Well, and <laughs> knowledge keepers. And uh, also I'd like to thank uh, President Audrey Poitra and Aaron Barn Barner because it's through the all the discussions we had and the meetings we had that we managed to get all these presenters. And, uh, and I think overall, these were very uh, full days and wonderful days of sharing and of learning. So thank you very much, all of you, for being here today and yesterday. Thanks.